good morning. Welcome to Marine View Church Online. My name's Jesse Skiffington, and I serve as pastor here at Marine View. And I want to welcome you today as we continue in our summer sermon series, looking at the early days of the church, the formation of the Christian community after the death and resurrection of Jesus. This movement continued as Jesus had instructed his disciples, he had shown them who he was, and then he handed off the baton of his mission to his followers, to his closest disciples, and, they, and he commissioned them to be his witnesses, to continue his ministry in his name, empowered by the Holy Spirit, and to be his witnesses in ever-widening circles around the world. In the last several weeks, we looked at some of the challenges facing the apostles in the book of Acts. Some were external challenges, others were internal challenges. As the community navigated these challenges, they, they really faced a question. And I, it's a question I think we still wrestle with today. Would they continue to do what Jesus asked of them? The stakes were getting higher. The threats were getting more intense. Would they stay faithful? Would they really do what Jesus asked of them and be his witnesses regardless of what came next? See, doing what God asks you to do, what Jesus asks of you, as a Christian, it requires trust. It requires trust, and it requires risk, and it's not always a comfortable thing to do. Will you trust Jesus enough to do what he asks? Some of our young people are heading on a trip to Scotland with Andy and Katie. It's the Youth Scotland team. Um, they've responded to God's call in their lives to go and serve in Scotland, to give up some of their precious summer months, those summer vacation months that are so precious uh, to young people, to serve alongside Christians in another part of the world, to, to see and experience what God is doing in churches in another part of the world. And that involves trust. When you step out in faith and you do what belie you believe God is asking you to do, it, it, it takes an act of trust. It takes courage and a willingness to sacrifice. And, and so these young people are trusting and they're giving up their time and energy to go and partner with those local churches to lead some VBS and do some fun things to share the good news of God's love with other Christians there. Our Youth Scotland team is heading out on Thursday, June 27th on their trip. So please pray for them as they go. Pray that the Lord would work through them and grow their faith and give them safe travels and, and uh, help them in their partnership with those local churches to be inspired by what Christians are doing in that part of the world. Doing what God asks of us involves trust. And it can be risky because sometimes doing what God asks, living his way, doing the, what we might call the right thing is hard. There's an old illustration that many pastors have used over the years that illustrates this. And, and it goes something like this. When we are thinking about trusting God or maybe we're struggling to do what God asks of us. The struggle to do what God asks of us is a little bit like a man who fell off a cliff but managed to grab a tree limb on the way down. And he looks up and yells, is anyone up there? And then he hears a voice, I am here. I am the Lord. Do you believe me? Yes, Lord, I believe. I really believe, the man says earnestly. But I can't hang on much longer. That's all right, is the Lord's reply. If you really believe, you have nothing to worry about. I will save you. Just let go of the branch. Then the man looks to heaven and says, is anyone else up there? Doing what God asks of us, what we call obedience, demonstrates faith and trust in God. And sometimes it can be hard. When we obey God and we live his way and we respond to the spirit and we choose to do what is right and good and godly, we demonstrate our faith and trust in Jesus. But sometimes it feels like we're being asked to let go of the branch and we're not exactly sure what will come next. In fact, you could say that faith without obedience and trust and is empty. If we're going to say we have faith in God, but we aren't obedient to God, trusting God through our actions, James, who is the brother of Jesus, says our faith is as good as dead. It's not really faith if we don't trust and obey. So how do we do it, and what does that mean for all of us? Well, for Jesus, teaching people to do what he asks, obedience was core to his commands. It was essential to his mission, that, the, the mission that he gave his disciples. And it was right at the heart of this new movement, the early church. These commands were there to bring life. The things that he asks of us are there to bring life, to help us live as citizens of the kingdom of heaven, to know God's love and presence in our lives and to share that with others and to develop the disciplines and heart that reflects his heart and brings us at peace and, and impacts our world. That's why he asks us to do uh, the things that he asks of us. And he wants us to do that. And we hear this in the Great Commission that right at the heart of disciple making and following Jesus is obedience. Jesus had said, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. 
The disciples were told at the heart of this new movement, part of what they were going to do was to teach people to obey. And that's a challenge in itself. When you teach people to obey, you're, you're really teaching them to do what Jesus says, to live his way, and you're going to have to model that kind of obedience yourself. When you teach people to obey, it's going to involve inviting them to trust Jesus and trusting Jesus yourself. Even when his commands are hard or bump up against opposition or you quite, can't quite understand or see how it makes sense, Jesus encourages his followers to obey and to teach uh, obedience as an act of trust and promises to be with us and to be with his followers always. The last part of that verse, right after he says, and teach them to obey everything I've commanded you, goes like this. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So in our passage today, we find the apostles facing a challenge related to this, to doing what God asks, what Jesus has asked of them, obedience and trusting. And it's one thing to think about obeying Jesus and loving our neighbor and turning the other cheek and loving our enemy and forgiving uh, when there's not really any opposition to that command or nobody really is checking on it. But obedience is hard when uh, we're asked to do something in the real world, when it involves a real act of trust and there might be some real life consequences. And I wonder what happens when you receive maybe some conflicting instructions. Uh, when you face a choice between what, doing what God asks of you, obedience to God, and doing maybe what the human beings around you are asking of you, what happens when there's a conflict there? What do you do? How do you navigate it? We're going to find out how the disciples did that. So you can open your Bible up to Acts chapter 5. And we're going to look at verses 27 through 42 today. And I just want to give a little of the context uh, for the text today. We're not going to look at the whole passage because it's, it's really a long one. But it's incredible. Right after Ananias and Sapphira and the thing that we looked at last week that was so hard, Luke tells us there was kind of an appropriate fear in the church. And, uh, and, and people were wondering what, what was going to happen next. And even so, the community kept growing. And the apostles kept preaching about Jesus. And miracles kept happening. And finally, the Sadducees, some of the religious leaders, had had enough. And they arrested the apostles and put them in jail. Now, we don't have time to look at this part of the passage today. But I want you to go and read it. Acts 5, 12 through 26. The apostles are doing amazing things. Peter is performing miracles. People are believing. And then they're arrested and in jail, an angel of the Lord comes in the night and sets them free and gives them the command that they should go back to the temple courts and keep teaching the people about Jesus. They keep to keep going. And so they see this miraculous release from jail. And when the high priest the next morning sent the guards to get the apostles uh, to bring them to trial, they found the jail empty and they were shocked and they wondered what it all meant. And finally, the apostles were discovered doing what the angel had commanded them to do on, on God's behalf, to go to the temple courts and to speak about Jesus. And they were defying the threats and the order of the religious leaders not to do it. And so they were brought once again back to the Sanhedrin for questioning. And that is where we pick up the passage. And this is what Luke writes. He says, The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin. That is the full assembly of the elders of Israel. Before the Sanhedrin. To be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Well, now we see the apostles have been commanded by Jesus to be his witnesses, to share the gospel in his name, to teach in his name. And the religious leaders of the day have told them not to do that, to not speak in Jesus' name. And they've threatened them, and they've commanded them very clearly not to do it. So we have these two sets of commands, two sets of instructions. What are they going to do? As we'll see, given the competing instructions and the potential consequences, the level of trust is high. The level of trust that's needed is increased. Here is a legitimate human authority, the Sanhedrin, this full assembly of the elders of Israel. Uh, and they are commanding the apostles in God's name not to speak in Jesus' name anymore. And really, the point that the high priest is making is that the apostles had already willingly and flagrantly, flagrantly disobeyed their instructions. And the apostles were faced with the question, do they really trust in what Jesus had done for them, what he had said uh, about himself and what he had called them to. Did they really have faith in Jesus and were they really committed to the mission he had given them? Were they really ready to do what Jesus asked of them and to be disobedient to the religious leaders regardless of the cost? Now here's the thing, they knew the right thing to do, to be Christ's witnesses. Often we know the right thing to do or what God would have us do, but we have to ask ourselves, are we ready for the consequences? 
They, were they ready to trust God enough to do what he asked, even in the face of potentially dire consequences for them? It could mean their very lives. Luke provides Peter's answer in his account, and this is what we read. Peter and the other apostles replied, We must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Now, I love Peter and the apostles' response uh, to this gathering of religious leaders whose job it is to discern and declare God's will for the people. He says to them, in the face of their instruction not to speak in Jesus' name, he says, we are only doing what God has asked of us. And he kind of takes a shot because when he says we are to obey God rather than human beings, he's telling them, the religious leaders, to their faces that they have missed it about what God has done and is doing through Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit confirms this, he says, for those who obey, who believe and do what God asks. You human beings, you can say what you like. We're going to do what God has commanded. Now, this obeying God led them to, in, out of necessity, to be disobedient toward the religious leaders. They were conflicting instructions. And this wasn't a casual thing. It was a big deal. And they knew it. And they knew that the consequences of being obedient to God and disobedient to the religious leaders could be severe. After all, they had seen Jesus suffer and die and many others suffer and die. They knew what could happen. And yet they chose to do what Jesus asked regardless of the consequences. They chose to trust. They obeyed God. They maintained their witness. Peter is making the case that they, the apostles, they're the ones who've gotten it right about God's heart, God's plan, God's purposes, while the religious leaders had missed it. Now, when they chose to obey God, to do what God asked, to, to follow through on Jesus' instruction to be his witnesses, they were also making a conscious choice to disobey the religious leaders. And John Stott uh, kind of puts it this way about the sort of the civil religious disobedience from the apostles that we see here as they choose to trust and obey God uh, instead of the religious leaders. And he writes, he wants us to, to, to know that this is a serious thing when we do this. He writes, to be sure, Christians are called to be conscientious citizens and generally speaking, to submit to human authorities. And I put a reference here in kind of in, in bookends to 1 Peter 2 and Romans 13 because there are passages which instruct us to submit to the ruling authorities that God has established, Paul says, for our good and the good of the world. And even when we disagree with them, disobedience should not be a light thing. It should not be a cavalier thing, uh, not done because of something we dislike or didn't get our way in an election or something. It's a big deal to be disobedient to the ruling authorities as a Christian. Because that choice will reflect on Jesus and may come with some real consequences. So we got to choose wisely before we decide to do what God asks and to disobey another authority. Stott goes on to indicate when the time may be right to take such actions, to be wise about it. But there may be a time where we need to obey God and by necessity that means disobeying an, another authority. He goes on, he says, but if the authority concerned misuses its God-given power to command what he forbids or to forbid what he commands, then the Christian's duty is to disobey the human authority in order to obey God's, God's authority. Now, uh, we read that, and I think in our divisive political times, it can be easy to take things that are maybe not salvation level, Jesus level, God command level, and, and kind of elevate them to that place. So we need to be careful not to be putting words in God's mouth based on maybe our preferences or our politics or peer pressure or maybe selfish desires. I can't tell you how many times I've heard someone say, God told me or God put it on my heart or God wants me to, and kind of fill in the blank with something that's an opinion or a preference or just something you want or whatever. This is a serious thing. When, when our conscience before God and we discern through his word and through the guidance of the Holy Spirit, and we, we wrestle it out in community with others, and we choose to obey God and to disobey another authority. It is a weighty thing. It should not be done lightly. But Stott, and, and here we see with the apostles, sometimes we may have to do that. As Christians, we have to discern, is what I'm being asked to do in conflict with what God has commanded or asked of me? Does it offend my conscience before God to the degree that I must choose to disobey? 
The truth is, at times, we may need to disobey human authority in order to obey God. And that takes an act of trust in God. And those times may become more frequent in the future. I don't know. But we need to be discerning about that. And we, like the apostles, need to trust Jesus enough to accept the outcomes and the consequences of that decision. Remember, the stakes were incredibly high for the apostles when they chose to obey God rather than this human authority. Luke writes this. When they heard this, they being the Sanhedrin, when they heard this, they were furious and wanted to put them, the apostles, to death. They chose to obey God, and it had the potential in this moment to cost them their lives. And, and soon it would cost someone their life. The consequences of their decision in this moment to do what they believed, Jesus asked them to be obedient to God as Christ's witnesses. It wouldn't end in their, their martyrdom here, but eventually it would. For nearly all the apostles, they would die for their faith and trust in Jesus. But now was not that time. Not yet. Luke goes on. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, who was honored by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men, the apostles, be put outside for a little while. Then he addressed the Sanhedrin. Men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. Some time ago, Theodos appeared, claiming to be somebody, and about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed, and all his followers were dispersed, and it all came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed, and all his followers were scattered. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it, if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. So Gamaliel kind of comes to the rescue here in a certain sense, and he just says, listen, if it's a God thing, it'll, you know, it'll show itself to be true. If it's not, it'll go away on its own. Just don't get too crazy here. He uses two examples of leaders who had led revolts and who were killed, and then their followers dispersed, and it came to nothing. And Jesus had been killed, so it stood to reason for him that maybe the same thing would happen. All this would come to nothing, and it would go away eventually. But if it was from God, he knew they couldn't stop it anyway. And in, in some ways, his words are prophetic. This new movement uh, was from God, and it was going to change the world. But for now, his speech worked to spare the apostles' lives. But it didn't work to shield them completely from suffering. This is what Luke writes. He says, his speech, Gamaliel's speech, persuaded them, the Sanhedrin. And they called the apostles in and had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Flogged, 39 lashes, 40 minus 1. The limit on lashes was actually 40, a Roman law. But in order to avoid accidentally breaking that law, the practice was 39 lashes, 40 minus 1, just leaving a little margin for error. And the apostles experienced in this moment a real-life consequence for their obedience. They chose to trust God and to disobey the competing instructions of the human authority and, and the, the threat against their lives. And they were spared from death by the reasoning of Gamaliel, but they were flogged, and again, they were commanded, ordered, not to speak in Jesus' name anymore. Then they were released, and it wouldn't be long, though, before Stephen, a leader in the church, would be killed by this same group of people because of his faith in Jesus, his faithfulness to Jesus. When we choose to do what God asks, sometimes those around us, they won't understand. They won't get it. Our trusting, our obedience, now, it may not rise, the consequence may not rise to the level of martyrdom where we die for our faith, but it may come with a real consequence. Doing what God asks may require a real choice that comes with a real consequence. Doing what is right when others are not can be a difficult thing to do. It can come with relational and practical impacts. When I was a kid, I remember one summer afternoon, I was walking with friends, and we found a golf ball, and we were walking through the small town, La Conner, where I grew up. And, of course, we started seeing how high we could bounce the golf ball on the pavement and see how high it would go. And then one of my friends got the idea to see how far he could throw it and bounce it along the road and see how far it would go doing it that way. And the only problem was at the end of the road across the street was 
a building and the local barber shop, and it was full of people. And so he reached back and he threw the ball, and it went flying, and it bounded several times, and then crashed directly into the window of the barber shop. And all of my friends scattered. They sprinted in every direction and left me and Josh standing there in the road. Even though we hadn't thrown the golf ball, we knew what the right thing was to do, the honest thing. The thing God would have us do was to go and to own up and to confront whatever the, the consequence was going to be. Now, fortunately, the window didn't break. I think it maybe hit the, the little bit of the mullion or something in there. It hadn't broken. The barber, of course, was kind, a family friend, grateful for our honesty. But my friends, especially the one who had actually thrown the golf ball, they were mad, mad that we had gone instead of running. In fact, later that same friend shot me with a pellet gun in the foot. I think it was some type of revenge. We don't know what was going to happen when we did what God asked. We didn't know if, how it would go. And there was a real consequence, relationally for my friends and, and physically for my right foot. Sometimes when we do the right thing, when we live as God asks, when it bumps up against the values or desires of others or the way that other people live or uh, the way that our world works, it may come with a real consequence, relationally or practically. And when we're honest, maybe, in our business dealings, and while others are, are not and they're stretching the truth or lying, we, we might miss out on, on some business or an opportunity. When we don't cheat and others do, they may get ahead of us. Now, we may not face persecution, but we may face real consequences when we live God's way, when we do what he asks, when we are obedient to him. The apostles had experienced a, a narrow escape from death, but they had not come out unscathed. They had been flogged. Luke shares the response of the apostles after their ordeal in the Sanhedrin. This is what Luke writes. He says, The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. Now, notice that the apostles kept doing what Jesus had asked. Even after their experience, they kept doing what Jesus had asked. They trusted him, and they were obedient to his instructions to be his witnesses. They even found joy in having experienced something of what Jesus had experienced, suffering and experiencing disgrace. They were willing to do that for the one they so deeply loved and believed in and trusted as Messiah, as Lord in their lives. So what does this all mean for us? Well, we've all experienced this at some point, I, I believe. I, I imagine for you, maybe it was this past week, or maybe you'll face it this afternoon. But at some point, you will face a choice about doing the right thing. Will you do what God has asked you to do? Will you do the right thing? Will you, uh, even in the face of consequences, do what you know God would have you do? We have some young people who uh, have just graduated from high school, and uh, I invite you to pray for them as they head off uh, to college. Those graduated seniors getting ready to head off to college, they're going to face choices daily in their new independence about who they're going to be, what they're going to do, who they're going to spend time with. They will face choice after choice after choice, just like we all do. I'm going to encourage them in the in-person service to make one of their first choices to go and find a Christian community to belong to and to get involved. Let your first choice be to invest in a local church or college ministry that can provide the support and encouragement and prayer and community and all that you need to navigate as a college student, uh, in, in, as a Christian college student. And, and if you're not connected in a community and you're a follower of Jesus, you need to go and find that for yourself. Make that your first choice. Be invested in the community of Jesus so that you have that support to live as he asks. All of us daily face a choice about doing what God asks of us, doing the right thing. And here's the reality is it, we're faced with that choice. And we know that the right answer is to do it, but there's a corresponding reality sometimes. When we do what God asks of us, it may not always be popular with others. It may not always be popular with others. We may face being made fun of, looked down on, called a hypocrite, or mocked for believing in God. You might be called a goody two-shoes, or maybe you'll just be left out of the social circle because you don't think or believe like they do. Doing the right thing isn't always a popular choice. But doing what God asks, doing what God asks will lead to life. 
Doing what God asks may cause you to experience a real life consequence relationally or practically, but in the end, it's worth it. It's worth it because of who Jesus is, what Jesus has done for you, for the love that he has for you and you have for him. It's worth it because of what we are promised in scripture, that Jesus will be with us always. We will have his peace in our hearts and his spirit with us, and we will be blessed. You will be blessed when you suffer for doing what God asks of you. And that requires trust. Do you have faith? Do you trust that you're going to be blessed? Know God's presence in your life when you suffer for doing what God asks of you? Peter, who had spoken up and, and kind of on behalf of all the apostles and declared his obedience to God, not to humans, he wrote several letters that are included in the New, in the New Testament. And I want to share part of one with you, 1 Peter 3. And Peter's writing about this, doing what God asks, even when others aren't, what, whatever comes and the blessing we receive. He says, whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. They will be blessed with God's presence and attention. And his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Then he asks, who is going to harm you if you're eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. You're blessed because God sent his son Jesus into the world for you. You have a relationship with him. As we come to the end of the message, I want to invite you to trust. To have faith in, what Je in who Jesus is and what he asks of you. Trust that what God asks of you is for your ultimate good and the good of those around you. Whether that's here or in Scotland or at college or in your work or at school or at home, choose to trust, to risk letting go of the branch, to do the right thing, the godly thing, to discern God's will and then to follow it regardless of the competing instructions of the world around you. You can do this with the help of the Holy Spirit and the support of the community that God gives us, the church. Next week, I would invite you to join us again. Um, we're going to have a Life Together Sunday for our in-person service, so come be a part of that if you like. We're going to look at the next passage in Acts, and we're going to see an administrative challenge that the community faced and how they resolved that. But in the meantime, let's pray and ask God to help us do what he asks, regardless of the consequences, to know his presence and to experience his blessing in our lives. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that you were with us and that you bless us with your goodness, your love, your presence, your peace when we live your way, when we do what you ask, even when it's hard, even when it's not popular, even when other people don't understand it or we receive maybe a competing instruction from some authority in our life. Help us to know and to be discerning and to be really wise about when to obey you and to disobey a human authority, to be careful about how we handle that for the sake of our witness. I thank you, Lord, that when we do choose to obey you and, and to, to, to not obey another authority, that you're with us in that, Lord. Help us to navigate that. And if there is a, a real-life consequence or outcome for choosing to do what you ask of us, to be obedient to you, I thank you, Lord, that you um, promise that we will be blessed even when we suffer for doing what is right. You know, bless us with your presence. Assure us of your good news. Fill us with your spirit and help us to keep moving forward to that flourishing life you give. And so, Lord, thank you for the time that we've had. Help each one of us this week to listen for your voice, to respond, to do what you ask of us. We thank you, Lord, for the time that we've shared. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen.